All right, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, excellent. All right, so first off, thanks, um, thanks for coming this evening. I'm Richard Ashworth. I work at a, a prop tech startup called Goodlord. I've been working on and off with Scala for about the last, um, the last four years or so. Uh, so functional design patterns in Scala. Um, this is going to be a beginner-friendly uh, friendly talk aimed at those learning functional programming through, uh, through Scala. We're going to work through a few examples of, of functional patterns um, in the course of this talk. So design patterns. I first encountered design patterns through, uh, through experience as a Java programmer. Um, those of you coming from a Java background, we're familiar both of this book and, uh, and some of the patterns involved there. If, uh, if you see anyone when reading this book, chances are they're preparing for an interview. Um, a lot of the patterns uh, do seem to come up. Uh, they're perhaps less, uh, less useful all the time. But, it, but the, the main thing is with, um, with object-oriented patterns, a lot of the patterns are concerned with creating and manipulating uh, behavior between objects. In functional programming, the patterns we're going to look at are a little bit different. Um, when we're working with, with Scala in a functional way, we, we spend time composing functions and separating different concerns of our business logic. So it's a different set of patterns we need to tackle these problems. Scala is a hybrid language. We still use these patterns. Um, but when we're working in a functional way, there are others we, uh, we look to instead. Uh, and it's those we're going to cover um, in this talk. So the first pattern, um, as a Scala developer, you like to come across is uh, algebraic data types. I'm sure everyone in this room is, is familiar with how we are, so we'll, we'll skip over um, explaining these in too much detail. Um, algebraic data types help us model a sum and, and product type. So, um, for example, we can say that uh, language is the, the disjunction or the sum of Java, Python, Scala, um, and we can use product in this way to say an identity has an address which in turn might have a postcode. For example, again, I'm sure everyone's, um, everyone's familiar with this. It, it gets a little bit more interesting when we combine some and product types in, in ADTs. Um, for example, if we're trying to model a development team, uh, we might use something like, like this type. Uh, so an employee can be a manager, a developer, or a tester, giving us our sum type. And then um, managers might have a set of reports, uh, which are themselves employees, which makes this, this recursive. Um, we might also want to say a developer has a primary skill, which is one of the language. Um, we're going to use this as an example, really, to introduce the next pattern, um, which is about manipulating state. So that pattern is called, is called lenses, and it's, it, it's really used to manipulate state while preserving immutability. Immutability is um, perhaps the most important thing in, in functional programming. Uh, so if we have Rich, who's a developer, and his main language is, is Java, when he, um, he changes his primary skill to become Scarlet, we don't want to change um, this Rich zero. We create a brand new object, Rich one. Um, and because a uh, developer here is a case class, we can do that um, quite conveniently using the copy method, creating, as I say, a, a new object where primary skill is Scala. It, it looks quite clean. It's fairly easy to do this um, for, for shallow values um, like the, the primary language. But it quickly gets a bit uglier, as we can see in this example, when you're dealing with nested values. So if, if our developer moves house, uh, we end up with code that looks like this. Um, and this is, of course, quite a trivial example. We can imagine this getting really quite ugly and messy as it starts to litter the code base. Uh, this is such a common pattern in functional programming that there are, there are patterns specifically designed for solving this, and, um, and those patterns are, are lenses. So a lens can be thought of as a pair of, a pair of functions for accessing or changing state, much in the way that we have getters or setters in Java. Uh, so we have two functions, get and set. Um, o here, the, the type is our top-level object who, whose state we're manipulating, and V is the value we're going to change either with, uh, with get or set. The most important thing to note with lenses is that they compose, and this is important when we're dealing with that nested state. Um, so, for example, if we want to, um, to change our developer's postcode, we, we can construct a, a lens from developer to address and then from address to postcode, compose those lenses to create a new lens, and suddenly we're able to, uh, to access that developer's postcode without having to go through the, uh, the nested calls that we did previously. Um, so going back to our example of the development team, the, the first lens is exactly what I've, I've described. We have, uh, in this case, it's developer to identity, identity to address, which we can then compose into a single lens. We can add a further lens and compose it with that. So performing lens composition twice gives us um, this developer line one lens. So we can edit line one of a developer's address uh, in one go using this, uh, this new lens that we've created from, from the previous ones. 
so in, in practice, if we're, we're using this code, we can, can write this much more tersely and certainly, in my opinion, much more cleanly than, um, than with before. Th this is really one of the key, um, the key features of patterns in functional programming, being able to abstract the mechanics of something here manipulating state into, into something separate, the lens, so we can hide away all of that complexity. Um, and then when we're, when we're changing these values, it's, um, it's much more simple to do using that pattern. That's something we'll see, um, we'll see time and time again in functional programming and, Sc and Scala. So we've looked at lenses. Lenses belong to a much wider family uh, of patterns called optics. Um, this includes things like optional, uh, which is very similar to the option type. So if we have a, a nested um, object hierarchy where not everything is defined, we can use optional to safely update, um, update state at lower levels in that structure. Um, the boilerplate can be reduced even, f even further. I've used a library called Monocle. Um, lenses are also supported in Shapeless and, and Scala Z. I certainly recommend um, checking these out um, if you're going to use these, these in your code. As I said, Monocle um, is one I've used. All right, so moving on to our, our next pattern. Um, we've looked at modeling data types in the system and manipulating their state. Uh, we now want to consider adding behavior um, to these types. And to do that, we're going to look at, uh, at type classes as the foundation for the next set of patterns. So traditionally, um, and certainly in, in my experience as a, as a former Java developer coming to Scala, it, it's quite easy to, um, to add behavior in a similar way that you would um, perhaps with, with Java using subtyping. So if we have some, some trait makes noise, and we want to say that, well, dogs and laptops make noise, we can um, associate them in, in a hierarchy using, using subtyping. So overriding the sounds uh, method for each, each type we're interested in. This is fine, but it, it's a little bit strange to have to say there is a relationship between dog and laptop. They're in the same uh, tree of, of classes just because we want to add some behavior to them. It, it's nice not to be able to have, to have to do that. And to get around that, we use ad hoc polymorphism in Scala, which is uh, supported through type classes. So here we have the same, uh, the same constructs, dog and laptop, and uh, a top-level trait makes noise um, for which we can implement some sounds. But here we don't have to extend that directly. We're free to um, create instances for the types we want to make sounds. Um, so we can see for uh, make noise dog and make noise laptop, we've done that. We've created instances of our, our make noise type class um, in the object. So when we're using these, um, we, we get those instances through the implicit scope, which provides, um, provides a lot of flexibility in how we can add behavior to our types. We don't need to arrive at these decisions up front when we're, um, when we're creating a hierarchy of, of classes. Um, here, we've made the, um, the, the make noise for dog that's picked up by the um, implicit scope growl rather than bark. And we can see here, um, when, we, when we come to, to print that out, we get what we're expecting. So it's quite a nice way of deferring design decisions in Scala rather than having to uh, encode these in the, the hierarchy. Good way of introducing uh, flexibility into our code. There's a certain amount of, uh, of boilerplates involved with these, um, these patterns, and functional libraries like CATS are an excellent way of, um, of reducing that. The patterns are so generic, it, it's often we can find something in one of these libraries to do what we need. And for example, the, the show type class, which is a way to, um, to get a, a string that represents our object without having to rely on print line returning, uh, sorry, uh, to string returning uh, something sensible. Um, the mechanics for doing this are provided in CATS. So we can see using, using code, we get some nice syntax for working with these types. Uh, instances for most of our basic types are provided. So, for example, we can just call 42, being an int, dot show, and we can get something sensible. Uh, and even for our own types, we can um, introduce instances for type classes quite easily. So, color show is introduced with the show dot show function, and we just provide that um, whatever function we need. So, in, in one line, we can arrive at this instance. Um, we can also add ex extension methods, which gives us convenient syntax. So in our business logic, we're able to just call red.show and get a sensible um, result using that color, dot sh color show uh, instance. This is really uh, the sort of foundation for a huge number of patterns in functional programming and Scala. We've talked um, previously this evening about, uh, about monoid and how this is used to, uh, to combine two elements or or merge collections of them in a similar way to fold. Um, we'll bring these, 
these patterns together um, with a simple example. So we're going to use a fairly well-known code cutter in which we, we need to convert a string of digits into um, a string that looks a bit like an LCD, uh, an LCD display, so on th three lines. To get this set up, we first have a case class LCD display that has the three lines of the display as three strings, uh, and then a, a companion object with a mapping from our integers to, uh, to those LCD digits as an LCD display type. With this in place, we can use our show and monoid patterns. So we, we define uh, instances for those type classes. Because LCD display is a, a case class, we can use product iterator and make string to ensure those, those three rows of the, of the display get printed on separate lines. And then our concat monoid instance merges two, um, two LCD display digits into a single LCD display. So it's just done row by row uh, with string concatenation here. The pass and display uh, functions are really there to, to bring everything together, to, uh, to, to read our input string and map that to, um, to our LCD display types. We've got a sequence of those. And then display calls the monoid to combine these into a single LCD display that we want to, uh, want to print. And we can see that this works if we, if we run the code. Because it's a monoid, this works for empty strings as well, because we've defined our, our empty function. Um, and we can see that the, the different concerns of working in this pattern are all handled separately. I think that's the, the most sort of important takeaway from, uh, from looking at things like type classes. It provides us a way to encapsulate that logic without having to uh, necessarily conflate different, uh, different things. So this is really just scratch the surface of functional programming and, and the patterns we use. Um, the, the Red Book is, is the classic place for, uh, for learning functional programming in Scala, and it contains many more um, contract constructs, but similar to the ones we've, uh, we've been through in this talk. Scala with Cats, um, the book by Underscore, is also excellent for, uh, for getting up to speed with that, that particular library. And what, one thing about um, functional patterns in Scala is they tend to, tend to build on top of each other. So once you learn one set of patterns, it becomes easier to learn the next. Um, for example, learning mon monad and, and type classes makes it easier to learn more advanced patterns like free, tagless final, etc. So that's all I have for this talk. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Cheers.